Welcome to the Work Trends Podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan Mbiro. Every week I interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And be sure to check out our Work Trends Twitter chat events calendar located at talentculture.com on the podcast page. Welcome, everyone, to the Talent Culture Work Trends Podcast, sponsored today by Empath Inc. I'm your host, Megan, and we are discussing skills development and how and why it empowers people. Skills development is a process of helping people learn the skills they need to improve their performance at work. It can involve formal training, such as courses and workshops, or informal learning, such as on-the-job coaching and mentoring. Organizations invest in skills development to improve employee productivity, motivation, and of course, engagement. When employees have the skills they need to do their jobs well, they are more likely to be satisfied with their work and less likely to leave the old organization and leave you behind. We are joined today by Carlos Gutierrez, co-founder and CEO of Empath, to discuss this topic further. Carlos Gutierrez is the co-founder and CEO of Empath, a SaaS technology platform that uses machine learning to transform the way talent is managed and grown inside a company. Previously, he served as chair of Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategic advisory firm. He also served as U.S. Secretary of Commerce from 2005 to 2009 under President George W. Bush, where he worked with foreign government and business leaders to advance economic relationships, enhance trade, and promote U.S. exports. Carlos played a key role in the passage of landmark free trade agreements that remove trade barriers, expand export opportunities, and boost global investment. Carlos spent nearly 30 years with Kellogg company, a global manufacturer and marketer of well-known food brands. After assignments in Latin America, Canada, Asia, and the United States, he became president and chief executive officer of Kellogg in 1999, the youngest CEO in the company's 100-year history. In April 2000, he was named chair of the board of Kellogg Company. Carlos joined ASG from Citi, where he was vice chair of the institutional clients group and a member of the senior strategic advisory group. He currently serves serves on the boards of the U.S. India Business Council, the Bo Owl Forum for Asia, Occidental Petroleum Corporation, MetLife, and Exelon. Carlos was born in Havana, Cuba. He is married to Adelia and has three grown children. He is based in Washington, D.C. Carlos, it's an absolute privilege to have you here. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and good to be here. Well, listen, let's dive right in. As the former U.S. Secretary of Commerce, What lessons did you learn about business and commerce that you were able to take and apply in real life work situations? Well, you know, one of the things I realized when I came to government, having been with Kellogg and being in Battle Creek, Michigan, you realize how much it matters who is in the Oval Office. One thing that it becomes very obvious in DC, boy, these jobs matter. And when you're off and you know, in the Midwest or middle America or someplace else, fly over territory. It doesn't seem to matter much, but that was a lesson that really hit me. Government is a very well-run place. That was also a, uh, a surprise. There are a lot of processes and bureaucracies and, and competition among the parties, but the processes are quite well done. And I think some of them can can be useful in the private sector. That's interesting that you say that because I think we always go to, oh, it's old school or, you know, they don't have really agile processes. I mean, let's talk about agility here. How is this single word so fundamental to the advancement of employees? You, You know, the thing about agility is that it's sort of the opposite of the way companies used to run where you develop a plan and you stick to the plan. Agile, an agile methodology or agility is just the opposite. You don't stick to a plan because you know that your environment will be changing very rapidly. And what we can do is change departments, change teams, move around, uh, redeploy people, and, and do that very quickly if you have a skills inventory of all your employees. So you can do an agile methodology even quicker than it would if you weren't able to measure skills. How can companies and leaders use skills learning to up-level their talent management processes and Why should they? Well, 
It's a good question. You know, in order to upskill someone, you have to know what their skill is. And not only that, but you have to know the proficiency level of that skill. Skills aren't binary. We use proficiency levels. So, you know, if I just get my driver's license today, I'm driving is a skill. But if you're a Formula One racer, you also have driving as a skill. But, but the two aren't the same. One is a four. And proficiency level and the other ones are one. So you need to have the information of the employee skills, proficiency levels, and the skills required to go to other jobs. And that's where you get the gap that you need to fill, the, the, the upskilling gap. And we do that for every employee in a company. You know, this is good for business results. The more companies put people in the right place, develop them, grow them because the world is changing and the job they had 18 months ago is not the same job they have today. So it's in the business's best interest to upskill people. And too many of our training pro programs, development plans are generic. You know, they'll send 3,000 people to, I don't know, a creative writing course. Well, some people need it, some people don't. But in that case, human resources just checks a box. So this is individual. This is an individual, individual performance uh, development plans. And you know what? I think it's really important to say that HR is checking a box because some of that is really true. How do semantic similarities come into play when assessing someone's skills or more importantly, their skills level? So most of the companies who are in this business of assessing skills. They either use tests, assessments, quizzes, which takes a lot of time. It's cumbersome. You know, people don't want to just hold up the company and have people going to take exams. But then as skills change, I suppose you have to take the exam again. And taking an exam wouldn't necessarily give you a proficiency level. The other thing that people do is they scrape resumes. We call uh, scraping resumes basically looking at a resume and trying to match keywords. So they find the word project, they find the word management, and they infer that an employee has project management skills. We can determine or infer that a person has project management development skills, project management skills, without finding the words project or management. So semantic similarity is really looking for words that have similar meaning and looking for words that describe what the employee does. It's work product. That's what the employee does. It's the employee's behavior. But we're not trying to match key words. We're trying to find similar themes similar sentences with different words that say the same thing. So performance reviews, there's a lot of practitioners in the audience that are listening that are in charge of performance reviews. Why are these traditional reviews no longer valuable and what can hiring companies do to replace them? Performance reviews are, I believe they're outdated the way they have been done. The whole concept of an employee review where the employee sits down with their supervisor and the supervisor will tell them what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong and they'll probably point out some anecdotes and some subjective observations which really have nothing to do with performance. And it is a terrible process. No one that I know who I know likes performance reviews. So what happens now when all of a sudden a, a company becomes a skill-centric company where the way people are managed is on the basis of skills, not where they receive their diploma, where they used to work, or who they know. It's all about skills. That's the key distinction. You know, in today's corporate world, satisfaction is very low, turnover is very high, and we have been I say we executives have been trying this for decades and uh, now we have the technology to do it right. Though we believe that growing talent internally is important, there are those times though, Carlos, when going outside the company to hire is necessary. How do we use skills development as a lure to attract new talent to their organization? How do people do that right now? What we do essentially is once we infer the skills, we build a library or a library is built for a company. And that's something that companies don't have. They don't have a database of their employees' skills. They have all sorts of databases, but nothing regarding their major asset. What we tell companies and what companies have found who use skills, who have accurate skills inventories, that the person they're looking for is already inside the company. They just don't know it. 
because they don't have visibility into, say, 20,000 people. They know the people who they see, the people who they know, but there's so many people in an organization who don't have the right diploma, who don't have a diploma, who didn't work in a certain area. Whatever excuses there are, there are people who are highly talented who are being left behind because they don't know their skills and the company doesn't know their skills. So let's talk about machine learning and AI. How does this all come into play with skills learning? And how does this help? And how does it complicate it all? You know, I hear sometimes about, well, are you going to have machine learning and AI determine the skills of a person or infer? I can can assure you that we will be more accurate in companies in this business than the subjectivity of human nature. So our algorithm, our machine learning algorithm captures signals on the basis of those signals, on the basis of of the semantics, they can infer, the the machine can infer what the skills are. It's It's actually a very complex technology, but you will never notice it. It's like picking up a phone and calling. You don't know what's behind the call. So we're lucky enough. We, you know, they're, they're great CTOs in the country. And we've got people who are data scientists, who are doing predictive analysis, who are working on skills that are far more accurate than anything that humans can do. So that is, by the way, IP. It's where we personally have the our patent. But being able to use semantic similarity is about the closest thing to two humans talking to each other. And we know this for certain. Companies that take people skills into consideration when projecting future business needs will inevitably fall short of those projections. Tell us more about how companies can create successful future plans and why skills should be included included in the strategy. Well, you know, skills has been the elusive goal for corporations. Companies have been wanting to do this for so long because they know that a skill essentially means what you can do, what you know how to do. The interesting thing is that if you ask the average person, how many skills do you have? Megan, if I asked you, I don't know, most people say they have four or five skills. The average employee has between 30 and 35. It's because we just don't think that way. We don't think of skills in that fashion. So we have one client, there's a client that he says his his workforce needs to be more candid. So candor is a skill that they look for. 30 to 35 skills. This is a brand new science here. And this is, is essentially, this is how, why people do a good job at what they do is because they have the skills to do the job. And the people who fail are the ones who don't have the skills. I can tell you that my best decisions and my worst decisions have been people decisions. This essentially lowers the risk substantially regarding people decisions. Yeah, I love that. Hey, we've all been there, right, Carlos? Nobody is immune to it. We've all made mistakes around thinking you're getting one person and, you know, realizing however many weeks into it, this person has an agenda or this person is hiding who they really are, or it's just not a fit. I could go on and on and on, right? That's exactly right. There are so many people who are in the wrong job. And it doesn't mean they're not talented or skilled. They're just misplaced. Absolutely. I'm I'm so with you on this. And I have to ask you a final question. I know we could talk forever. Do you believe that skills development is the competitive wave for the future for companies? And if so, why? Yes, this is a mega trend. And the only reason why it's taken us so long, the corporate world, is because the technology, the methodology to do this in a way that is easy to do, it's lightweight, it doesn't require a lot of manual intervention, has finally arrived. So we believe this is a mega trend and it is all about skills. So it's not enough to know that you you took an MBA and in that MBA you had a finance course. The question is, do you have financial skills? And in the future, jobs are going to change so quickly because of technology. It doesn't mean that we all have to become data scientists, but our jobs will change because of technology. So every job in the country will change and we have to be ready to change with it. The the only way to really grasp whether you're doing that is if you can point to a skill and say, this is the skill that needs to be improved and it has been improved. And that's the technology is able to do that now. Without that, it's just very difficult. It's very, very, imagine a baseball team. Well, can you play first base? If you can't, you can't. It's a shame that in business, people don't 
talk that way because it's, it's not threatening. It just means, hey, you're a great guy, but you know, you don't speak French. So that can change the way corporations, the culture they build, the way they manage people, the way they coach people. It's a totally different conversation than someone telling an employee, this is what you're good at and this is what you're not good at, which is terribly demotivating. Yes, it is. And at the end of the day, if you've known me out there in the work trends and talent culture audience for a while, guess what? People hire people after all. Carlos, thank you so much for stopping by today. Hey, thanks a lot, Megan. We'll see you again. Thanks for listening to the Work Trends Podcast, your favorite source for all that's new and exciting in the world of work. If you love what we do here, make sure to share our podcast with your friends, your family, and don't forget to tune into our next episode. Catch up with you next time. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.